Today, the algos are innocent. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. A couple of weeks ago, I made a show about algorithms and how they're taking over the world and how many people are just blaming them for everything that's going wrong at the moment. Now, of course, that was a strong point of view. And I guess there's also an opposing point of view because I've now been approached by Amit, who's a technical guy, who believes that the story is rather different. So, Amit, hello, welcome. Hi, Martin, how are you going? Yeah, pretty good. Just introduce yourself to the audience first. Sure, my name is Amit Sawate. I'm, uh, I have my own little uh, fintech startup, and what uh, I, I used to be programming since 1995, and I've worked with m most of the bigger banks or bigger technology firms. I used to be with IBM as well previously. So now have our own little startup and yeah, and I felt I can, maybe I can help contribute towards uh, how, how software is built and you know, where algorithms come in and how, what, what their place is in the overall scheme of things. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for spending some time with us. And look, you know, to be honest, of course, algorithms are no more than just a set of rules that are actually mathematically represented. It's how they're used and how accountability is adjusted and aligned to them, which is a critical question. But um, let's start with uh, your perspective on what an algorithm actually is. Sure. So this is just a, a small introduction for specifically for the DFA audience. I've tried to keep it very high level. So <clears throat> it, it's just more towards just getting the point across. So quickly, just what are algorithms? What is the software development cycle? And I think in your uh, show, what you were really referring to was the machine learning and where if, a user, if someone wants to learn more, I've given a couple of links just to introduce the topic. And if, if anyone wants to get in touch, I'll put my details as well. So just going in quickly is, what is an algorithm? Uh, as you mentioned, it's just a set of steps to accomplish a task. And now when you bring that into the computer algorithm world, it's a set of steps that a computer takes to accomplish a task. And you know, what you do is, very simply, on, on this side now, I'll just explain one uh, algorithm. It's reasonably complex. I did keep it complex to just make the point is, we start with the input data, we do a set of calculations, and then you stop when you get the answer. That is usually the breakdown. And, I mean, and not to go into the actual algorithm, so it's just, I have input, I do computations, and I come out with an answer. That's really it. Now, and you know, if I wanted to express this in code, then here is just a, a set of steps on how I would write down an algorithm, a, a computer algorithm. Say, my what's my input? I I check uh, a result. If if a condition is met, I do this or I do something else. Now, yeah. So now this, this is just an algorithm. And now, really, what I want to do is how how we build software. So when when I approach a client or a client to approach me. How do we go about building the algorithm, uh, deciding what is the algorithm to be built? Now, what we want to do is build software. And what it does is, it's usually we want to process a, a set of tasks that will accomplish something for, for the end client. And there are two predominant software life cycles is we either go for the waterfall or the agile. And really what I wanted to talk about is that the the models really determine which step is done when but really essentially you normally do the same steps which is you do the requirements analysis then you do a bit of design some uh, and then some coding then you check if the coding is working and then if you find a bug you you fix that so and the part that well, I wanted to talk about here is the first part, which is the requirements analysis. I'm just skipping ahead to one diagram that I had, and then I'll come back to 
uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I just wanted to bring up this uh, uh, this diagram where you know uh, where, whether we need to give a loan. And I've taken this example primarily because we you know we're on DFA, and this this was a specific example you mentioned that uh, where people are where people get to a loan or not, and that's decided by an algorithm. So I just wanted to tease that out a bit, if that was okay. Sure. So the, the first point is we check, okay, does, does the customer have a, a credit history, yes or no? And in and this is a very oversimplified uh, algorithm for it, but it's just to illustrate the point. Now, we'll first check, okay, does the person have an established credit history? And if they are good or bad, if the credit history is good, do they then how much are they currently, uh, uh, how much, what is their current debt level? So, and then I'll just quickly check, okay, whether they have, say, uh, is it greater than 1,000? Yes, no. And in this example, we just said that, okay, if they have a, a debt greater than 1,000, then let's say, let's say no for, for giving them a loan. If they don't have a, a loan greater than 1,000, let's give it to them. And conversely is, if they don't have a good credit history, do they have a guarantor? And it is the guarantor, uh, have a, then I do the same example on the guarantor to be able to see, okay, if the loan does go well, or if someone, if the person can't pay back, can the guarantor pay back? So this is, this is more, it's just more stepping through the points. The key point here is we have a finite set of decision points that when it, when it is reached, it will then come down to the next step. And that's the key goal. Now, how do we, at the point of creation of software, what we do is we decide what is the, the, the set of steps to be done. Now, and just to go back in here, and this would be done in the requirements component. So we'd come to a client, we'd say, okay, at what uh, do you want to check for credit history? Uh, do you want to check the uh, the credit record of the person? Yes or no? Now these are requirements that we agree with the client. They normally depend with now. If you look at uh, uh, if you if you look at the uh, the the credit algorithm specifically, you you check with the national credit code where it says okay for this amount of loan, for say a loan above say $5,000, you must check the person's uh, credit history. So the, these, are, these are imported to us from legislation. So we get these requirements from the legislation. Then we get requirements from the clients themselves. What, what are the exact uh, details to go through? What, what do we need to check for, say, you know, in the event that a client wants to see, okay, does this person have a buy now, pay later uh, the debt? So then uh, we'd ask, uh, we'd then go to the point that, okay, now we don't have this data, we'd have to ask the user to give that data, saying that, okay, we'd ask them a series of questions, they'd answer that, and then we'd be able to determine the next step. So. The, the requirements will come down to okay. Here is the here are the parts of the legislation. Here are what the business requirements from the client are. Then we'd come up with a design, and then that design would normally be approved or or iterated upon based on what the client wants in that algorithm or for the process, uh, the machine, the computer to do. Then once that's done, then we go and develop that. And then obviously with the client, we'd always test them. And they'd, they'd always have a part to say that, no, this is right or no, this is wrong. Now, it's very rare that a, that a, a program that we've developed will go straight without testing, without uh, checking its accuracy, will go into production or, you know, will go live with uh, users' real data. Where, where a lot of gaps happen and where a lot of problems happen is if we missed a requirement or if a certain requirement was not elicited at the right level. Now, you say, you know, with our example of checking if a person has a buy now, pay later account. Now, could, could we check or does, you know, one of the gaps would be how to know if a person has 
all the, uh, an account with zip or afterpay or klarna you you won't know it it really comes down to self reporting now if the person says no i do have it then then okay then then you know we can say, we can take out the requirement to say okay check if the person ask the person if they have a zip uh, account ask the person if they have an afterpay account so these would be specific questions that we would ask and we get answers to and so keeping in mind that uh buy now pay later are not necessarily reported on a, on your credit report so there's no way to tell whether the person has that account or not so we in this instance then we depend on uh the user to tell us now this this is not hard and fast these are i'm just using it more as an example just to tease out that that component if if that's okay Sure. Yes. Okay. But of course, um, quite often um, you won't be building software from scratch. Uh, you know, a, a company might decide to buy a predetermined set of software with a predetermined set of rules from an existing vendor, and therefore the question is: Have they understood how the vendor defined the rules that they are now adopting? Sure. Now that's an interesting point. So. Uh, I definitely agree. Most uh, software that we use, uh, enterprise software that we use, is not custom built. Uh, what what we do find is that vendors or even packages that are utilized now. You would have heard a few of the banks would use major packages. They have specific rules engines, and usually the vendor or the uh, or the lender themselves or the client themselves will articulate some rules, and those would go in. now the 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 vendors depending on how much effort they put into the business analysis component and how much effort they want to say okay this looks good enough or this is something that's fine they would they would normally have that cycle to see okay they, this this sort of makes sense or these are the set of rules that we agree upon normally every vendor would uh, would have this in writing and would put this towards Okay, here are this custom set of rules, and but I do get your point that there are some standard set of rules that the that would be there now. You know, we say a standard set of rule. A standard rule in this instance would be to check the user's age if they are eighteen years old. Now, this is a standard given in most financial services. So, you know, whether the client understands that okay, that there we are doing this check or not. it may have not been elicited or it may not have been explicitly mentioned that okay the package will first question will ask is are you 18 years old so usually they they'll find a bit of the testing that when when they do acceptance testing they'll say that okay uh, you know the terms and conditions have been agreed to in the terms and conditions we have it written there that you are above 18 years old something like that right Okay, so there's a bit of a trade-off going on there between the vendor and and the uh, client, and uh, I still think one of the critical issues is well, is everybody clear about precisely how this algorithm is actually working and what the results are, and is it as expected, right? Because it goes back to the fundamental point that I made in my earlier show, which is that many people turn around and say, "Oh, I didn't realise that's how the algorithm worked." Later, and then they can walk away from it and say, "It's nothing to do with me; it's the algorithm." Yeah, true. No, true. I I get your point. Now, <clears throat> that the obviously these are the points I'm making as someone who designs and implements the algorithm. Mm. There would be end users who would not be aware of all the complexity behind it, and they would just uh, they just say, okay, you know, I put in this number and it gave me this output. So definitely at that point, I would uh, I'd say that it depends on the person and their. how much has been explained to them on on what this algorithm does now these are highly sophisticated and very complex algorithm i'd be very surprised if one any one person can articulate a whole credit algorithm you know you'd have to be a very spe- uh, very knowledgeable and experienced specialist to first to be able to understand what is actually happening because these have been built up over year over decades these algorithms so it's not you know one small thing and you know to your point it they are extremely complex 
you know, I, I, I bring the analogy to like a car. Uh, the, the technology has evol- evolved over hundreds of years and we, we know how to use them. You know, okay, turn on the indicator, we put the, uh, you know, you, you do this or just for the user specific functions and how to interact with that complex technology is what most people know and understand to get to what is the actual business rule behind it. You'd have to go from a business user, uh, you'd have to go from the end user to a business user and then probably behind to the designer of of that. And usually that would be the vendor who would understand the the complexity of the, the system, but they would always implement it with regards to client uh, uh, <clears throat> to client requirements. And I think that that is the key point where the client usually will have the legal obligation of we have we, you have the law will apply to the end client who's doing the business, say in this case, say a lender, it, and then they will get support from the vendor to be able to do that. That doesn't take away any responsibility from the end client who say offering a loan product. Hmm. OK, now let's then move on to the machine learning aspect where effectively the technology becomes so sophisticated that it can tune its own algorithms and as it learns it improves and therefore perhaps moves further away from the fundamentally designed algorithm that it started with. Sure and and, and I'll just introduce the topic and we can uh, I'll I'll take a stab at asking you because it is quite a complex one I'm, I'm trying to see how I could answer it in a simple, simpler manner. So going into the machine learning part now, <clears throat> here, here is where I'd say, you know, we can classify at a very high level. What is artificial <coughs> intelligence? And the key part is machine learning is an algorithm so that it the machine can understand without actually programming it myself as a person that it can understand, okay, this this answer was correct or this answer was wrong, or not even correct or wrong. It was closer to what is a better output. And the, because the uh, the networks are so complex or, you know, the algorithms are so complex, what you have is, you know, on this side is like a decision tree. Now, I've taken this example of a decision tree with, say, you know, one, two, three, four nodes. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight decisions. Now think of this where it's not four nodes and eight decisions, but think of this as there's millions of uh, nodes and literally mil- you know, hundreds of millions of decisions. That is what machine learning does. It takes this to the next level. Now, where the automated components come in is that, or the machine learning comes in, is that we allow for, there is, uh, there is uh, learning that we, that is sort of supervised and then learning that is unsupervised. Now, those are more, uh, you know, those that is going down the artificial intelligence path. But one thing I'd say is, that there are algorithms that decide, say the, you know, your YouTube algorithm or the, you know, the, on Spotify to be able to tell which which song you like. Those would be more examples of unsupervised, you know, where it can do what it, it's got a base set of rules. And then within that, it can uh, keep getting better and better. And because the your, your input set is close to infinite, where, you know, the number of songs that you like and how do you pick a song that you like so <clears throat> so the, the algorithm then sort of goes about its way but now when you say come to lending l- lending can't go down the uh, unsupervised part because there is a legal accountability so it needs to be within the uh, the supervised component of learning uh, of machine learning so there has to be a person where the output has to be reviewed and said yes is this accurate or not. So the the supervised the I'd say financial services normally exist in the supervised machine learning if there is. It it really has that accountability because it is responsible it is responsible for because at the end a person or an organization is responsible for the outcome of that. Now you know and to get if you get it wrong, you know, say if you didn't 
if uh, YouTube gave you a video you didn't like or Spotify gave you a song you that you didn't like, you know, the the outcome, watch it, okay, fine, you'll just skip and you'll go to another one. But say when it comes to lending, you know, the consequences are much more, uh, much more serious and there is a legal accountability for that. So that, that's where the machine learning component, it, it has to be supervised, it has to have uh, requirements that well define its cases and it cannot go beyond that. Now, it, it's, it's really easy to say, oh, the, the algorithm did it. it. Then the question comes to, okay, who's the person saying it and what's their uh, understanding of that algorithm? And then, you know, we'd have to go from the end user to the, say, the power, uh, the person who understands how the system works, at least at a, uh, a higher level, then someone who has, say, maybe understood it at a much lower level, say, a business uh, analyst, and then someone who's technically understood what the actual program has done. So then, you know, let's say a developer or maybe a solution architect, something like that. You know, that's very interesting, I mean, because what you're actually highlighting is the long chain of decisions, right, from the strategic business decision to go down a particular route into the tactical implementation of that from a business perspective into the technology domain where it's effectively constructed and tested and validated and back again. And there's a long chain in there, isn't there? And that's really the point, because if, if at any point the decisioning between one of those elements is actually off key, then effectively the end result might not end up where people think it is. So the, the, the real challenge comes to not when you, if you get your requirements wrong, then your design is incorrect. Then, you know, you've tested for the wrong thing. You've missed something. So the, the cost of fixing a problem is the lowest way if you catch it up front. Mm. Now, if you, the fact that you've got it later, to go and fix everything, it's a whole different cycle again. So. Mm. The, in the software development life cycle, it comes down to showing what, where to catch the bug. And if I spend a lot of effort with my clients on the requirements part, have we got this right? What is the real, uh, what is the real challenge that you're looking to solve? And now I've see, I've found many, you know, there is lots of uh, ways to build it. So the, I've shown the two predominant uh, software development models and in, in financial services we kind of use a hybrid like you can't go completely agile or you you can't go completely waterfall where i'd say you know where you do everything you know because otherwise then you'd only be doing requirements for a year before you write anything up so so there is a hybrid and there are trade-offs and i'd say in this cycle this is where a good developer would try to get as much in in writing or at least agree with the client that see this is what we're doing you tell me if there's something wrong here you know and and then someone will go back oh i found this defect or i found this you know what we normally refer to as bugs oh this is a bug this is a defect here fix this so <clears throat> yes yeah, so as with any technology you know most uh, most i'd say algorithms for this keep changing and one of the the interesting points i wanted to bring up is the nature of data is changing so the same algorithm that did credit decisioning say 10 years ago is fundamentally different from what it is today and that's because of the new data inputs that have come about now say 10 years ago no one was doing buy now pay later so that was not a question that was asked at that point mm. Although it is, now, it needs to now because of its uh, usage. So that that those are the examples of how they would need to evolve. Yeah, and that's really important, isn't it? Because it's not like once you've written the algorithm, it's set in concrete. You know, it evolves because the external world evolves and the data points change and all of those things. So there's often a continued maintenance and tuning of algorithms and existing systems. And as you say, many of them are very complicated. I mean, we're not just talking a few decisions, but uh, many decisions and many data points and many inputs. And so the whole decision tree and the complexity of managing it highlights the difficulty 
of um, you know big algorithms and then it comes back to so where does accountability ultimately lie because essentially you've got the computer running a series of rules that are determined by the way the program works whether it's um, you know AI or whether it's not and then that goes back up into the business domain who had an intent originally to do something and then the question is well is that intent actually what actually was done or did the intent get scrambled because the way the algorithm works and then you go back up the chain a bit further and say, and was that intent, intent actually correct and accurate and appropriate? If you take the um, uh, the, the recent example with Centrelink and the uh, robo debts, right? Um, it's now transpired that a lot of what the business was trying to do was actually not legal. So they started off on a false premise, and then that rolled into the development of algorithms that then executed and delivered that false premise. So in a way, you can't just put the algorithm on trial. You've actually got to put the business owner on trial as well if you're really going to get to the bottom of this. Sure, and, and to add to that point, I definitely agree with your view there. To add to that is more on, there is a testing phase in, most, uh, in all software development lives. And right. you know what you mentioned with what was my intent to what is the result? Hmm. That is verified. And you know, programs like uh, RoboDead now, I have no idea about the actual algorithm. You know, being on the outside, I'd be very surprised if it was not tested. It didn't go through that. When, when uh, customer X has condition uh, say Y, the, out, the answer should be Z. Hmm. So, they all uh, software development goes through that uh, life cycle and th there would be a set of business rules that would be determined now what one of the things that came out in robodeck and was public was that they used an uh, they used an approximation of someone's uh, position financial position now that as a business rule was determined hence it would have been said okay at this point this is approximately what we'd expect this person to uh, to have earned. That was a business rule. That was not an algorithm going crazy. That was some person decided this is what needs to happen. This is what uh, comes out. And then uh, th that result would have been tested. Now, whether a, whether a person did a good job on testing it or not, I have no idea. But I can tell that there was a business rule that would have been verified in during the testing phase to be able to say, yes, it was determined or not. And usually after the testing phase, it's only then that it goes to the end client. So, you know, you'd be very surprised if software is just written and goes, because it won't work, it'll crash. There'll be so many problems, you know. Uh, you know, it'll, it'll come down to, uh, uh, you know, most of my friends make, make, uh, make fun of, uh, Windows, uh, Windows, right? So, oh, Windows crash, right? And it's it's because of the sheer uh, permutations of how many things can can uh, can go wrong. Hmm. Now, writing those algorithms on say say like RoboDeck to be able to uh, determine the whether a person w was uh, old or not. Now, not going into the legality of it, just the pure science of it, how to calculate that. Now, it determines on what data was available for, for that person. And in, uh, in, the, in the government side, one of the key things is our privacy uh, legislation also says what, how shows how much data can be shared between gov uh, government departments as well. So there are those restrictions as well. So if, if you don't have the actual data, then, okay, what are the assumptions or what could have, could uh, B, the case would be approximated. So those would be the types of methodologies used. I, I have no idea what was mm. specifically used in this case. No, absolutely. But it does it highlights the complexity that we're getting into here, right? In terms of you can't simply blame the algorithm and say the computer did it, right? <coughs> uh, because effectively the computer is just following orders, right? Um, there is a whole context here, which was what the business decisions were, what information was available, what the legal context is, all of those things are actually in the business domain. And yet I of observe, uh, you know, as I've been watching this over the years, that quite often people in the business domain, the owners, try to blame the technology and the technologists for what's actually a set of business decisions, a business rules, actually a business ideology that they're actually propagating. 
Uh, definitely. <clears throat> I'd say it's a, there's always a argy bargy between business and technology. <laughs> business will point to tech, or, you know, they didn't do the, this. Tech will always say, come on, I did what you told me, or what you didn't tell me, or see, here's where I went beyond it. <clears throat> I'd say it comes down to the, the people running that program and mm-hmm. what is the what are the budgets that have been given, what are the timelines that, more importantly, the timeline that has been set the experience of the developer and the experience of the business person as well, making the, the you know, whether they were aware of all the legislation, whether, so, you know, there, there are, so, it is so complicated, you know, we, we take it for granted that, oh, okay, oh, I'll write a, you know, oh, there's software for that, but there's countless uh, uh, person hours gone into building it. And, yep. and then once it's built uh, into verifying, is it doing the right thing? Yep. Now, where we have such complex data, data sets as inputs, as well as outputs, and then those outputs become input to other algorithms as well. So, <laughs> so it's, it is a challenge, but when the legal accountability exists, it, you know, the, the efforts, that should be taken into uh, account and that should be, a, that effort should be put in, you know. Like, I'll, I'll give you one example from uh, one of my colleagues who had a work for a telecommunications company and uh, the, the telecommunication company sent out letters uh, for, uh, you know, for not, not bills, but more uh, compassionate letters uh, thinking that the person, the account holder had passed away. Now, this this uh, caused a bit of stress on many people because it it turned out that the person who was writing that the business requirement forgot to mention that in a table when you look up check for this one particular flag to see if the account holder is deceased or not you know whether the per- person deceased so the person forgot to check that particular field and ran it across the whole table or the or a given set of uh, people. And what happened was people who were, they, people got their own letters to say that, oh, we're so sorry you passed away. So it was it was a major, major clangor and it, it caused a high level of stress in many people because they also were, you know, in cases where families were estranged, when where people haven't talked to each other, the next of kin got, uh, got that letter uh, that uh, saying and it was at a different address so there are many problems that come in but these are these aren't challenges that are algorithmic in the sense these aren't challenges this was i mean someone missed a requirement and right. it it was programmed in a way that was that was uh, defective in the in to begin with in terms of a requirement not in terms of the programming part there are cases where the program doesn't do what the requirement says but usually that gets caught in the testing phase. Hmm. But yes. if I missed a requirement, <laughs> yeah. that causes me a lot more grief usually down the track. Right. But the point you're making, and it's one which we should underscore, is that uh, you know these mistakes and errors have huge consequences. And uh, you know, if take the robo debt case, very significant consequences for for individuals and families, and um, therefore getting the process right and understanding how the rules translate into algorithms and the algorithms are then executed appropriately um, is a big complex um, set of scrambled eggs, frankly. Um, Trying to unscramble it afterwards is of course always the challenge. And uh, that's really what I was trying to make in my earlier show was which was that lawyers now are beginning to understand that they need to understand more about how algorithms work, how they're constructed, who designs them, how they're designed, and what rules were driving them to be able to actually um, begin to, um, you know, deal with the consequences when things go wrong. I'd say in, in terms of the lawyers, I'd say the, the people building them, those are the ones that I'd really advocate to really put their heart and soul into knowing the consequence of getting it wrong. Yep. So, you know, normally what I do is when I'm looking at my algorithms and say, okay, what's the worst that can happen here? Okay, fine, you know the wrong song comes up okay it's okay yeah yeah you know or the wrong you know the, the, my, my my computer screen crashes or as opposed to okay if i'm doing it in when i'm doing it in financial services 
okay, someone is going to be denied credit, then mm. what do I need to do to ensure that I get my, my thing right? And <clears throat> this is where I'd say most people should have to put in the effort. And, you know, you're talking about the tail end of when it went wrong. That, that would be usually a small percentage, but, you know, it can go spectacularly long. Even that one thing that you did wrong then makes news and everything else is forgotten for, say, the 99... Uh, 999 times you got it right, that, that'll go okay. But the one that you got it wrong is going to be in the newspapers. So, so there are challenges there. But I'd say if lawyers want to get to know about it, they should be asking more, okay, how was this design? Mm. And, and can we see the business doc- documentation that, that was used to create it? What was your testing? What was your defect rate? what were the major defects that y'all caught. So <clears throat> I, I, uh, normally all this is covered by intellectual property. So it would be very, uh, very surprising if lawyers, you know, who would be given that brief because then I, I'd expect them to go through like a confidentiality agreement so that they don't go and share this with, with others. But normally in packages, the uh, how packages or uh, software packages would be designed is that it will allow me to configure a rule. So I don't have to program it. I just have to say, okay, if the credit record exists, then do this. Mm. So it's a series of if and else and then statements. Normally, I can uh, I can put in what the configurable business rules are. Uh, so <clears throat> those business rules are a lot easier to get a hold of. Those would normally come in like a business uh, requirements document now. When a developer builds uh, builds something, usually, say I'd say 90, 90% of the times, there would be this document. And it's always good practice uh, to, to come to the point where, okay, even if I was not given a requirement at the end of what, when I've done something, I'd say, okay, here's what I've done. Please sign this off. And that's where, <coughs> excuse me, that's where the tech and business, they, you know, sort of that game of cat and mouse comes in there is that, okay, I've done what you've told me. No, 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 you've done something else. Yeah. So it, it's, it, it, never, it never goes away. That, 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 that will never go away. That's part of the creative process in, in this instance. So you, you can't have a perfect algorithm that does everything or you can't have a perfect, it really comes down to what were the constraints. Okay, the time, the budget, the skill set, and the the knowledge base on which it was uh, done on. Yeah, well, Amit, I really appreciate your time today. That's been very interesting. Um, if people want to find out more about what you do, where do they go? Yeah, so this is us. So <clears throat> so just www.battlerz.com and just click on and contact us. It'll send me a mail. And if you want to say hello on LinkedIn, uh, this it's just my name, uh, first name and then last name, Amit Savate, A-M-I-T-C-H-A-W-A-T-H-E. And then I've also got a little uh, here are links if someone wants to learn more about algorithms, the software development lifecycle, or machine learning. I've just picked up a few simple links if, if someone wants to learn more about the topic as well. We can send that and I'll, I'll send you the, the links so that we can post them in uh, Great. On, on the channel. Great, Amit. Well, thank you very much. I'll put those links in the comments below. And uh, I think we can conclude from our conversation that the algos are nearly innocent, but actually <laughs> with everything as you look at it, it gets more complexity. Um, but I do think it comes back to what the business intended and what did the business really intend to do what they did. Uh, and quite often in retrospect, they then turn around and say, oh, no, 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 we never intended that in the first place. But that's a whole nother story. Definitely. And, and thank you so much, uh, Martin, for uh, allowing me to bring the chance where maybe technology can we can bring forward the complexity and the challenges of building software <laughs> so that you know, it's not it's not always the algorithm, you know, uh, it, it's it's not always oh the machine did it. You know, that's a very convenient way of just passing the buck. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, enjoyed the conversation. I met. Uh, take care. Thank you for having me, Martin. Thanks a lot. Cheers.